welcome to this really wonderful opportunity that we have to host Jason Everett, Father David Belushi, and also soon we'll be popping in uh, Wanda Garanska, which is Pier Giorgio Frassetti's niece. Um, I'm so excited about this opportunity because, well, and you may be thinking, why is the John Paul II project hosting something on chastity and Pier Giorgio Frassati? Um, it is not just because Pier Giorgio Frassati is one of my absolute favorite saints who has been so significant in my life and in my vocation, um, though he is, but Pier Giorgio is, uh, was, was a role model for John Paul II. He came across him as a young adult. And then when he was a cardinal, he is the one who gave the uh, title to Pier Giorgio as Man of the Beatitudes. Um, and of course, the theme of chastity ties into John Paul II's work, uh, his life work, his intellectual work, and his work at the ministry with young people in terms of the theology of the body, uh, which I won't get into now. I know you don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from our speakers. So just a couple housekeeping um check here just a couple housekeeping notes uh you are totally encouraged to ask your questions so the way that you do that is there's a little uh q and a button on your on the bottom bar of the screen so you can put your questions in there and then if you have a technical question you can put in um a message in the chat right there so just feel free to kind of go right ahead. Um, and yep, I'm super excited. So let's just kind of get started. I think I would like to maybe let's start with Father David Belushi. If you can give us just a little bit of an overview of who Pier Giorgio Frassati is. And, um, and then we'll get into a little bit of chastity and then connect the two. So Father David, who he is the author of this new book called Pier Giorgio, Truth, Love, and Sacrifice, which we will be giving out as a giveaway. We're going to pull from one of the names at the end of uh, this webinar, along with giving away one of the books from uh, Jason Everett's Totus Tuus Press. So, um, Father David, can you give us a little bit of information about who is Pier Giorgio Frassati? Sure, okay. Um, first of all, thanks for having me, and it's wonderful to be able to share uh, my knowledge on Blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati. He, um, so he was born April 6th in 1901, so it's good to keep in mind the historical context in which Pier Giorgio is born. This will affect many of the decisions that he makes in his life. So uh, we're now celebrating 120 years, right? Uh, 1901, April 6th, just a uh, about a week or so ago was his birthday. He was baptized uh, Pier Giorgio Michelangelo. That is his first name, Pier Giorgio Michelangelo Frassati. And he was born in Turin, which is again going to have uh, an effect on him, both the industrial context of Turin in the early 1900s, but especially because this is Northwestern Italy, it's Piemonte, and Piemonte is where you have all the Alps. This is why Pier Giorgio is um, hiking at a very early age with his mother. This is right on the Swiss border, French border, this whole Alp region, and Pier Giorgio knows the Italian Alps quite young. In fact, one of the first trips, um, hikes he has with his mother, he is eight years old, and um, his mother, Adelaide Ametis, even writes in her, her memoirs, telling us that she had her boy tied to a cord as they were climbing the mountain together. The mount is called Teodulo, right along the Alps. The mother, as I bring up um, Adelaide, it's important to remember the, the role she had in his, his life as well, because she is an artist. And she had a sense of the beautiful being, uh, being an artist and she would have transmitted this sense of refined beauty to her, to her son, Pier Giorgio. And the other quality that um, comes out that his mother really transmits to her son is the sense of fortitude, perseverance. When you're climbing a mountain, when you're a kid and you're with your mom, and as you're growing up, you learn fortitude at a young age. And this is going to reflect the way he has a sense of perseverance in his values. So this starts already in childhood 
with his um, father, Alfredo, Alfredo Frassati. His father is uh, a trained lawyer, but he then opts for a career in journalism. He believes that he can do more for society as a journalist than as a lawyer. And again, we see these values even from the father um, transmitted to the son. What can we do to make our society, our world a better place to live in? He is also an Italian senator and the Italian ambassador to Germany. This is also important for Pier Giorgio because it means early in his life, he is going to have ties with Germany because his father is there as an ambassador. He'll be visiting Germany, he'll be studying German, and he'll be um, also learning how to speak German. The family is quite, um, they're really Germanophiles. They really love Germany. And there are these exchanges, ongoing exchanges with um, while they're living there. So the, the father then has this influence as well on his son as far as um, the value of truth, the value of justice. Pier Giorgio inherits this, um, this is transmitted to him. He has, um, they have a private tutor in the home and so they receive for three years when they're children, um, right until uh, from about 1907 till 1910. So until he's about nine, 10 years old, they have a private tutor, Rosina Busato. Then they start, um, I say they, he and his sister, Luciana, they're only um, about a little more than a year apart, they go to uh, a state school called Massimo D'Azeglio. And it's at Massimo D'Azeglio where they, um, this is going to be around 1911. This is the time when Pier Giorgio receives his first confession uh, and then his first communion. His first confession is 1910, in fact, and his first communion is 1911. This is also important to remember because it's around the time that St. Pius X is going to encourage frequent communion. This is in the Catechism of St. Pius X of 1908. So we already see the value being attached in terms of uh, frequent confession, this sacramental value, which is going to influence Pier Giorgio when he eventually goes to this uh, Jesuit Institute. He goes to the Social Institute in um, 1913. So he's 12 years old. This is the time when he's going to also have his um, first, well, his first, he's going to be confirmed in 1915, while he had a year of studies at the um, uh, Jesuit Institute called the Social Institute. Again, the Social Institute is very important because it has a major impact on Pier Giorgio's spiritual life. Already there's a, a, a spiritual disposition present in Pier Giorgio. He's very sensitive to to good values. He shows these good values in his letters. I base most of my work really on his letters, as well as what witnesses had written about him. But the um, Jesuit influence at the Social Institute is going to have um, a major impact on him spiritually. We already see this because he asks to have a frequent communion. So from the- Father David, sorry, yeah. I'm just gonna, um interrupt you for one moment. I just want to welcome Wanda Garanska, who's no, joining us yeah. today from yeah. Italy. So Wanda, so wonderful. So happy you are here with us. Oh, hello. Good to hear you. Hello, <laughs> Senora Wanda. Good to see you. Good yes. to see you all. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so good. Oh, um, yes, we're really excited to have you. I know, um, some students are, are already kind of raising their hand, wanting to ask questions. So um, so I think uh, maybe at this time, it's a, 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 good, a good little moment. You know, if Father David or Wanda, if you can, if either of you, um, Wanda, Father David was just giving us a little bit of background about Pier Giorgio's um, upbringing, kind of where he came from and the, the influence of his, his family and instilling values in him. Um, if you would say as a young adult, uh, what was Pier Giorgio passionate about as a young adult? What did he give himself to, either of you? Does either, either me or Father, Father David answer, yes. <laughs> as a young adult, um, he is really passionate about, we already see this happening uh, in his involvement. They're called the St. Vincent Conferences. Uh, he is passionate about 
um, reaching out to the poor. This is very clear in his in his letters. Many of his letters are concerned about the um, poor people in Turin, even in Germany when he's in Berlin. He also gets involved with the Catholic Student Society while he's in Berlin. Again, he's concerned about um, the poverty in, in Turin and in Berlin. This is after the First World War and both cities you know, have experienced the effects of, of the war. So Pier Giorgio is very concrete. He wants to do something to help these people whom he comes across. So there is, um, uh, there is, as I mentioned, the St. Vincent Conference where he first begins at the Jesuit Institute, and then he continues when he's at the University um, of Turin, the Polytech in Turin. So he continues with these activities. These are very concrete expressions of his faith reaching out to the poor. That is uh, at the, if you want the social level, he's obviously passionate about mountain climbing. I mean, this is one of his great um, outdoor passions. Uh, but I would say it's secondary to reaching out to the poor people. Um, and he's passionate about his faith, all his letters concerning his faith. He loves his Catholic faith, and he wants to convey this faith to others, share it to others. Um, but the work with the poor is the translation, the concrete translation of his faith into um, the world in which he lives. He's very connected with the world around him. He wants to make the world a better place, basing his his idea of values entirely on the gospel. Thank you so much, Father. Um, now, at any point, just a little note for our participants, if any time you want to say anything, Jason, Father David, or Wanda, you can just chime in. Wanda, I was, yes? I was thinking because the, the program of this is on on uh, chastity and pureness of Pia Giorgio joining the uh, but they could warfare, no? That's, yes. that's the idea. Well, I think before before talking about about um, uh, chastity and purity of Pia George, I would like very much to read you a letter. And I, I'll ask my nephew to read it because he's a better reader. Because <sighs> this is uh, a letter that he wrote after Pia George had fallen in love with one of the girls who was older than he, two years really. But it was a girl. Who, he used to go in the mountains with, and she made, afterwards she became part of the TP Losking and everything. At a certain moment, he decided that he thought it better to not to see her anymore, to just, the girl didn't know anything about him being in love with her. He never, he never, not only not mentioned, but if he sent a postcard to her, he would send it to all the other girlfriends, etc. But I think it's very important to read this letter that he wrote to a friend the moment he decided he wouldn't see her anymore for some time. He thought he would kind of close his his own feeling because she didn't know anything about it. And I asked my nephew Stash to read this letter because he's a better better reader and he's voila. Turn it around. Hi Corinne. Hello, Sash. Thank you. Yes, and it's good in a male voice, so you can really get it across. <laughs> uh, I'll give it a try. <laughs> in my inner struggles, I have many times asked myself, why should I be sad? Why should I suffer, endure this sacrifice unwillingly? Have I perhaps lost the faith? No, thank God, my faith is still firm enough. And so let us strengthen. Let us reaffirm what is the only joy which, with which one can be satisfied in this world. Every sacrifice is worthwhile, if only for that. Then as Catholics, we have a love which surpasses every other love and which after that, owed to God is immensely beautiful, just as our religion is beautiful. Love which has as its advocate that apostle who preached it daily in all his letters to the various faithful. Charity, without which, says St. Paul, every other virtue is worthless. It is indeed what which can be a guide and direction for our whole life, for our whole program. This, with the grace of God, can be the goal toward which my soul can strive. Well, my plan in this is to transform the special liking that I had that I had for her, which wasn't willed, to the end to which we ought to arrive in the light of charity, 
in the respectful bond of friendship understood in the Christian sense. Perhaps you might tell me that it's madness to hope this, but I believe if you pray for me a bit, that in a short time I can achieve this state in prayer. So this is my plan, which I hope to achieve with the grace of God, even if it will cost me the sacrifice of earthly life, but it matters a little. I think, I think this is so, so beautiful, the way Pierre George has a love for the girl, he sacrifices and, and says, after all, we have an even more beautiful love, which is charity. And that, that is, it. yes. Well, I leave you with this letter to discuss <laughs> more on, on how, how chastity was really the joining, the joining the angelical warfare. It has been really a cornerstone of Pedro's charity. Yeah, that is so good. So um, here you have this young person um, who, you know, here he's on this pedestal of being a blessed as we know him now, but he was a young adult with same feelings, same struggles um, that that any young adult goes through, that young people go through. And here he is, he has totally fallen in love with this girl. For those of you who maybe don't know the background story, he's totally fallen in love with this girl, um, but not to get into the reasons here why, but basically decides to not pursue this relationship with her. And um, she has no idea, there as Wanda no says. I mean, the relationship was a relationship like with all other girlfriends he had. There yes. No, no, absolutely no, no, no difference. Yeah. Yeah, no, no romantic relationship, no, but no, he, had, no. he had a friendship. Um, and she, she didn't know about his, these feelings. So he's not a flirt. Okay. <laughs> he was, he, he was a gentleman, right, Wanda? He was a gentleman. Um, was and a <laughs> yes. <laughs> And he, he writes to his, his friend this, um, this, this letter that was so beautifully written that, um, yeah, just asking for prayers to be able to actually truly make this sacrifice and elevate his love for this girl to a higher love, which is charity, which he tries to make the aim of his life. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe this is a good opportunity before we get into uh, Pierre Giorgio's chastity and connection with with charity, maybe Jason, it would be good to hear from you um, to give us, you know, you're the chastity guy, right? So give us a little insight into chastity and, you know, people have, it's like this awkward topic um, to someone who really doesn't maybe know much about it. So like, what can you tell us about chastity in connection with the whole person well I, I think the question that we initially led into what is Pier Giorgio passionate about um was kind of the key to how he practiced chastity I think what Pier Giorgio was passionate about was others it wasn't all about him and his lack of selfishness is very much a root of his joy I was reading earlier the one of the letters he wrote regarding this young woman Laura and you look at the love that he had for her I'll just quote him here he said she is whom I loved with a pure love. And today in renouncing it, I desire her happiness. I urge you to pray that God gives me the Christian strength to bear it serenely, and that he gives her all earthly happiness and the strength to reach the goal for which we were created. Thus she will always be for me a good friend who having known her in the most dangerous years of my life will have helped me uh, to keep on the right path toward the goal. And then elsewhere, he said, um, I love this quote, he says, in, the earth, in this earthly life, after the affection for parents and sisters, one of the most beautiful affections is that of friendship. And every day I ought to thank God because he has given me men and lady friends of such goodness who form, uh, form me a precious guide for my whole life. And so here's this woman just by pursuing God on her own, that probably doesn't even realize the impact she's having on him of keeping him on the right track on keeping his eyes on God. And this quote that one of the most beautiful forms of human affection is friendship. And so friendship and that love for the other is really at the root of chastity. I mean, you see his desire for her, her goodwill. All I want for her is all earthly happiness and even the happiness that goes beyond this world. And so that love that he had for others 
is what gave him the capacity to practice this virtue of chastity. Now, chastity is not simply mere abstinence or the lack of sexual activity. Chastity is the ordering of our sexual desires according to the demands of authentic human love. And so whether you're a priest, a celibate, widow, 20 years old, 50 years old, all of us are called to practice this virtue. Now we all have, you know, different desires and temptations and God's not telling us that like, oh, we're bad for desiring intimacy or all these things. No, it's just that we need to take these desires, give them to God and ask him to order them so we can be free to love. Because if I'm being controlled by my passions, I'm not free to love. It's only through that self-mastery, that self-control, can I truly make a gift of myself. And so if Pierre Georgia were driven by lust and selfishness, he would not be free to, to love Laura the way that she deserved to be loved, as a friend, as a sister in Christ. But because he put God first in his life, he became free and free to love her as he should. Yeah, that's so beautifully put and really brings a lot of clarity. Um, I, I'm just going to actually make a little note here to our listeners, um, our participants here. If you have a question, just as a reminder, don't use the raise hand feature. Use the Q&A feature. I know some of you have your questions in there. And then uh, we will kind of choose some of those in a little bit and have you um, ask them directly to the speaker. So, so uh We'll, we'll get in there. I'll let you know that your question is chosen, and then you can go ahead um, and ask. Um, but, okay, so now it'd be interesting to know if Pierre Giorgio, here we're talking about him as somebody who, I love how you put that, Jason, how he was not interested in himself. Like the connecting key is that he was selfless, and it wasn't inward. And how much this looking inward and being focused on myself um, leads to a variety of vices and how much being focused on the other person and of giving yourself, you know, man does not find himself except for a true gift of himself, right? How giving of yourself leads to um, the flourishing of, of these virtues. So um, maybe Father David could you tell us a little bit about a practical step that Pier Giorgio took in order to help commit himself um, to living chastity and particularly because uh, there's a Dominican connection there. I have my little statue here of Pier Giorgio, my, my friend and brother in heaven, um, that is from the Dominican house in, in Krakow. They have a little shop there, which is awesome. Um, and so, Father... You being the Dominican, maybe you can tell us um, sort of in a, just just briefly, just kind of explain that as this is the 100 year anniversary of, of his involvement with the Dominicans. So go ahead, Father. Right. So this is in, um, you mentioned Concrete Step in 1921. In 1921, uh, he already knows the Dominican chaplain where he's studying at the uh, Turin Polytech, Father Filippo Robotti. And um, it would be from him whom he received the, um, whom he found out about the angelic um, warfare confraternity. So uh, in fact, what's interesting is that Pier Giorgio's interest in St. Thomas Aquinas, normally people who get to know St. Thomas will be first of all uh, drawn by the Summa Theologiae for which St. Thomas is well known. But in the case of Pierre Giorgio, what drew him to St. Thomas was actually the cord. So this cord that is associated with the chastity of um, St. Thomas Aquinas. And the cord has, uh, the angelic warfare confraternity has a whole history associated with St. Thomas Aquinas where he was, um, uh, he was, joining the Dominicans against the wishes of his parents. The parents had other plans for him. And um, they tried to, the mother, Theodora, tried to have him abducted by his brothers. And the brothers, um, he would have been 19 at the, at the time. Uh, St. Thomas would have been 19. The brothers took him into one of their family castles and uh, kept him hostage there. And what they tried to do was have him seduced by, um, by a woman so that they figured uh, once he is seduced by this woman, he has 
uh, he has no longer the chastity in him that is needed for religious life. And so uh, they thought they would succeed. And instead, what happened was um, uh, St. Thomas went um, after her with a fire poker and he brandished the door with a cross. And then St. Thomas said that he was during this time of uh, being approached by this um, this woman, he was he was courted by angels. So there's this cord associated with St. Thomas Aquinas uh, being girded during the time he was uh, approached by this seductress. So this cord is what Pier Giorgio Frassati would have venerated because it was kept in um, in Turin. This is the way um, the events are explained. The Dominicans in Turin had this cord, which he venerated. And this is mentioned by uh, his sister, Luciana, uh, Luciana, as well as a friend of his, uh, Franz Massetti. They both make reference to the devotion Pier Giorgio had to this relic of Aquinas. So he got to know really the Dominicans um, through St. Thomas and specifically this chord that is a chord that uh, is there as an expression of chastity, right, being chaste. And so he joins the angelic warfare confraternity as a result of this, uh, this relic really uh, that represents chastity of St. Thomas Aquinas. The angelic warfare confraternity goes back to, it's an actual confraternity that goes back to 1727. It was after the events of St. Thomas Aquinas, um, Pope uh, Benedict, Benedict XII established this confraternity. So it's a formal confraternity that still exists and that um, Pier Giorgio Frassati be, became part of a concrete step, as you were asking, his concrete step to, um, to help him and to help anyone who wants to um, grow in purity and grow in chastity, in being a chaste person. And this would have been perhaps one of the most concrete steps he took. And it's really what led him to um, Dominican life, and in fact, how he discovered St. Thomas Aquinas. Sorry, I was muted there. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing, Father. Um, now, this is a, a question for Jason Everett. What can young people do today? What kind of steps, I suppose, can young people do today? Um, do we need to be getting fire pokers? What, what do we need to do? <laughs> if there's a fireplace on hand and, and, a, and a hot fire poker, those work pretty much 100% of the time. But if you don't have a fireplace handy, uh, there's some other things <laughs> that you can fall back on. Um, you know, again, going to Pierre Giorgio, like where did he say we should go for the grace to get pure? There's another quote I just want to share from probably my favorite quote of his, where he says, with all the strength of my soul, I urge you young people to approach the communion table as often as you can. Feed on this bread of angels, whence you will draw all the energy you need to fight inner battles. Because true happiness, dear friends, does not consist in the pleasures of the world or in earthly things, but in peace of conscience, which we have only if we are pure in heart and mind. And so he doesn't say, okay, well, you just need to try harder and do more. And it's no, you get this from the bread of angels. This is where the angels go. This is where we need to go. We need to approach that altar as often as possible. You know, he'd get up early in the morning to, you know, jog up the hill to go to mass, you know, before his family was even aware. And I often say that daily mass is really only for people who have nothing better to do, um, which is all of us, because there is nothing better to do than the sacrifice of the mass. There's nothing more important in our day than that moment. I had read the life of one saint, and he said every action he does during the day is in preparation for his next Holy Communion. So that's how he oriented his whole life. All I do today is going to be ordered to get ready for that next Mass. And so that Eucharistic spirituality of Pier Giorgio was lived out in his life. I mean, here's a man who literally lived the Mass. This is my body given up for you. Well, that's what he did. That's how he ended up on his deathbed was by living out the Mass. This is my body given up for you. And even on his deathbed, 
of him communicating, hey, here's the bus tickets and make sure this guy's got his medicine. I mean, he could be wallowing in self-pity on his deathbed. Oh, woe is me. I'm 24. I have so much to live for, but here I am dying. No, no, no. Still in his last breath, thinking of others. And so that Eucharistic love, I think, came as a gift from God. And so if you really want purity, um, yeah, there's a lot of practical steps we need to take of like, well, don't date people who don't share your values, avoid occasions of sin. All these strategies are very good and helpful. But at the end of the day, purity is a gift from Jesus Christ. And if you want it, he will give that gift to you, but it comes from him, not from us. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Wanda, um, here we've been, you know, talking about Pier Giorgio and 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 his connection and seeing him as a as a model. Is there anything that you um, want to add or comment on on what Jason had just shared? Um, no, I think he I think he said it very beautifully and and very well. This is this is I don't know. I think I think uh, Pier Giorgio he was. Obviously, he had temptation like everybody else, but I think he had no, his, he was so living with Jesus, so in love with Jesus, and everything he did was so following his love of Jesus that I think the chastity thing was a problem for him, but it was not a, not a spiritual problem. He had no, 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 there was no discussion on it for him. I mean, that was... It was clear. <laughs> um, well, before we get into some questions here, um, I just want to remind people. So we're going to open it up for questions, um, and I can I will let you know, and I'll make what I will do. Make sure that you are unmuted on your end, and I will allow you. I'll click. I have to like click a button to allow you to speak. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, if you have questions for any of them, um, I am. You know, just put it in the question and answer, that little Q&A chat, and then I will let you know. Um, and kind of before we get into that, uh, Jason, do you have um, anything to say about, there's a lot of young people that I speak to who have this desire to be a saint, they get inspired, um, but they struggle with mastering the chastity issue here um what, what can you say about that yeah, i would say a couple people things, who are struggling yeah, Go i ahead. would say a couple things to keep in mind is that chastity in and of itself is not the barometer of your entire spiritual life you know a lot of people think okay as long as i get that perfect god really loves me and wait a minute i messed up and i looked at pornography once last one. Oh, god hates me and like their whole spirituality hinges on that one virtue and obviously it's an important one. I mean, blessed are the pure in heart, they are gonna see God. But there's a lot of other stuff going on in your life that's really good. You're progressing in generosity and in prayerfulness and in mercy and forgiveness. And like, there's so many other things that are going good in your life. Don't be overly despondent if you fall in this area. Sometimes God lets us experience our weakness on a chronic level so that we can realize our utter dependency upon him. Whereas sometimes we want our own canonization process to start un unfolding, you know, decades before any of that's supposed to happen. And so God lets us stumble so that we can realize, you know, because if, if we're overly depressed about falling, it's a sign of pride that I'm so astonished that I'm a sinner. How could that have happened? It's like, hey, we're, we're weak. And so we don't want to lose our peace. Obviously, it should bother us and we, okay, we need to repent and feel a little guilt and try to do better. Um, but we should keep our peace in those times that we fall because the devil wants to get in there and say, oh no, that's who you are. You are the addict. You are the broken person. You, you know, like that one priest once said to me that, you know, God knows uh, your sins, but he calls you by your name, but the devil knows your sin, knows your name, but he calls you by your sins. And so your sins are not who you are. And so when it comes to chastity, yes, awesome, important virtue. But if you're stumbling, if you're falling, welcome to the rest of humanity, okay? We're all wrestling in our own different ways. 
but it can help teach us dependency on Christ and on the sacraments to persevere in this. But just don't try to fight it alone. Make sure you have accountability with friends, family, a good spiritual director, a confessor, that you're not just going lone ranger when it comes to this, because it can get discouraging at times. But if you've got support, you realize you're not alone in your struggle. And God just isn't waiting at the finish line for you to become perfect. Uh, he's there in the trenches with you. He's in you by virtue of your baptism. Um, and so just continue to come to him in prayer, and you'll find that you'll live as you pray. Thank you. It's a very good answer. And one of the thoughts that yeah, go ahead. Wanda had just said is that for Per Giorgio, I think his chastity was a natural outpouring of the way that he already lived his life. Because he lived the rest of his life in a way that prioritized God, chastity wasn't more difficult than it needed to be. I mean, modern men cause 90% of our own temptations by who we hang out with and what we look at on screens. If we would just control those parts of our life, chastity would still be a challenge, but it'd be so much more manageable. And so because he arranged his life in such a way that everything would give glory to God, these virtues weren't more difficult than they needed to be. I mean, someone once said to John Paul the second that being a saint is not difficult. And it's like, oh, really? Well, I thought it was really hard. It's like, no, we're the ones that make it harder than it needs to be. Yeah, that actually um, is touching upon a question that uh, someone wanted to ask here. Beth, I'm going to let you ask your question. Um, it seems like a good one. Okay, so Go this ahead. is directed for uh, Jason Everett. Uh, so what are the best steps to help a friend who struggles with porn and emotional chastity? Okay, very good question. Um, first and foremost, prayer and intercession for that person. So if you can pray for them, fast for them, that's of most importance. Um, second, they take an interest in their whole life, not just in that one broken aspect of it. Because if like every time we get together, that's all that we're focusing on, you know, it, 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 it's not balanced, right? I mean, we've got to take an interest in their entire life. In terms of practical strategies that you can share with this person, and when it comes to the internet, get something like Covenant Eyes. CovenantEyes.com will set up, it's a screen-based artificial intelligence porn internet safety filter thing. So whether it's coming in through Snapchat or Instagram, a web browser or a sext message, Covenant Eyes can catch all that, block it, and send your accountability partner and a report every day. If it's a guy who's struggling with it, I recommend the book that Matt Fratt and I did together called Forged. It's a 33-day book program, and every day of the book, you get a different video from myself, from Father Jacques Philippe, Father Mike Schmitz, Sister Miriam James, psychologists, doctors, husbands, different people just encourage you each day on how to live out this lifestyle from a perspective of psychology, neurology, theology, spirituality, to address it from a fully personal level. So if it's a guy, I'd encourage him to do the Forge program. If it's a girl, Kelsey Skoke wrote a great book called Uncompromising Purity, that it's not just a guy problem. Because a lot of girls think, oh, well, lust, isn't that something the guys are supposed to struggle with? Because I'm really struggling with this. There must be something wrong with me. And so Kelsey does a great job of saying that, no, 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 this is a human challenge. It's not just a guy thing. And here, as women, we might need to battle this a little differently than our brothers do. And we experience temptation in a unique way. And so she gives her strategies and uncompromising purity and the male ones we give in that book forward. So I think those two things paired with covenant eyes as an accountability filter would be real helpful. And in those books, we obviously get into a lot of the important stuff of going to regular confession, sacrament, reconciliation. If you're looking in terms of more emotional purity and chastity, I'd recommend Sarah Swafford's book uh, called Emotional Virtue. And she does a really good job in there, especially of showing like women are such integrated beings that their body wants to go where their heart goes. And so if you have no restraint over your heart, over your emotional life, then it's going to be very difficult to restrain the physical part. And so we need to learn to have custody of our imagination, of our eyes and our hearts. And if we do, having custody over the body will be much more manageable. So if it's emotional, I'd say get emotional virtue for the guys forged, for the girls uncompromising purity. And you can see all that at chastity.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Beth. I think, uh, Corinne. Yes, go right ahead, Joanna. I, I think in Pen Giorgio, it's so, so important the attitude towards, towards life also. I mean, here, what helps you? Pen Giorgio was so interested and so involved in so many, in so many things. 
beautiful things in life in so many struggles, really trying. I think the, the idea of what Pier Giorgio said, vivere not vivacchiare, no? to live, not to just get along, that stops you also from all, all having thoughts about, about uh, being chastity or not. If you have so many, if you see your life as something important and something that you really vivere non vivacchiare, that's, that's very important. Yeah, yes. I think it was one of the saints said that, uh, I think it was St. Robert Bellarmine, that no one is exposed to more temptation than he who has nothing to do. And if, if there's anyone who never strikes you as being bored, it's Blessed Pier Giorgio. You don't really see images of Pier Giorgio like, gee, I have nothing to do today. You know, I browse <laughs> the internet in 1924. Yeah, like, no, I mean, he's always doing something. And, you know, since he didn't have that idleness, the devil just didn't have as much time to, to bother him and tempt him because he was off doing good things. And so super important, just be, be active doing good things and the devil will have less opportunity to come after you. Yes, I, it's funny you say that. I remember actually, Wanda, one of the things um, that I had asked you years ago when I was a younger person um, about what impressed you about Pier Giorgio. And I remember you told me, um, how did he have time to do all the things that he did? <laughs> um, <laughs> right? <laughs> it is true, yes. It was, it's completely right. He was... He was known in Turin, the one who runs always. He was always, I don't know how, how he managed and how in all this, let's not forget how much time he gave to prayer, how important prayer was with him. Because one can see it in his letters also, in the book of letters, which I advise very much to read. And there, in, near in every letter, he always asks friends for prayer or he's praying for something, somebody else. So that is was very, very important in his in his uh, daily life also. And one must not forget that. Yeah, how convicting that is. It's not just that he was this activist that did a ton of things um, at the heart of what he gave his life and his time to was prayer, which is so, so convicting and so um, such a guide for all of us who are trying to, to work for the Lord, to prioritize prayer. Somebody said that, Joe was telling me recently, my husband, about, um, or maybe it was George Beigel that said how John Paul II, he prayed things into being. Um, so when you look at these people who have fruitful lives, it was an overflowing, it was a manifestation of their prayer. And, and it makes me think of, um, here we are quoting the saints and everything, but um, I have one to add. Uh, of Saint, I think it was Ignatius of Antioch who said, the glory of God is man fully alive. And how we see that in Pier Giorgio and how I've seen that in in the young people that I have worked with. Um, and it is it is so beautiful to see. Um, so there is um, Sylvia had a question. Sylvia Marks. Um, I, I don't know if you saw my response to you saying that you can go ahead and ask uh, one of your questions there. So I'm going to allow you to speak if you want to go ahead, Sylvia. If you can unmute yourself. If not, I'll ask a question. I'll ask your question for you. If you have a little issue getting in. Um, all right, let's see here, Sylvia. So, okay, maybe she's having a hard time um, getting here, but she actually had a question. Um, I think it looks like it's directed towards Wanda. She wanted to know. Um, What's the status of Pier Giorgio's canonization? It's uh, for Pier Giorgio's can canonization. What is necessary? It's an approved uh, miracle. I think there are different different miracles that one hears around the world, etc. But but uh, it needs studies and uh, approved. So we must pray for the miracle. <laughs> okay, all, great. All what is necessary for being. But I think he's already a saint, you know, because if a, say, a great saint like John Paul II, as a cardinal, called him man of the Beatitudes, what, what can be, what more, more can you say about being a saint than being the man of the Beatitudes? 
And then he said, although he is not yet at the altar, he's a patron of the academic youth. He said he died young as young people, as saints die. I mean, he, he canonized him. And he's being a saint, so I consider him a saint. Let's see. Oh, yes. Yeah, t definitely. And didn't he, I mean, he, didn't John Paul II go to the tomb of Pier Giorgio when he was a pope before yeah. he had beatified him? Yes, he came. He came to Polone to pray. It was beautiful. He came to Polone to pray at the tomb of Pier Giorgio, which was Pier Giorgio at that time. For the beatification. The beatification was not decided yet because the miracle hadn't been approved. And, and John Paul II came and uh, prayed for 20, 25 minutes. He prayed on the tomb of Pier Giorgio. It was incredible. And he was so happy that day. And there he said that the first time that he said himself, because people said that Pier Giorgio has been an example for him when he was young, etc. But there he himself, he said, me too, when I was young, I was under the impression of his, of his um, witness. Wow. That was so, fantastic, his visit. Yeah, I, and you, you were there, right, with your family? Yes, yes, we were there with the family on the tomb. So beautiful. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. It, it, um, was, it was unofficial. We, till the day before, we didn't know if he would come or not. Because <laughs> afterwards, afterwards, we were told, because he, he didn't want to make an official visit, because he might have been forbidden by the Vatican to go on, to pray on the tomb of somebody who is not yet blessed, you see. So he had to keep it as a secret, as a private visit. Wow. Wow. That's John Paul II for you and a testimony to, to the strength of Pier Giorgio's witness. Um, there's someone, this is like a little bit off topic, so I don't want to go too much into it, but I do want to let Mary Reinhardt just share this little story since we were talking about canonization. Um, Mary, if you want to go ahead and, and share that. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm sorry my dog decided to get upset. But this is for Wanda. Um, my dad had a massive brain tumor in 2004, and he sent me a piece of cloth that was used by Blessed Pierre Giorgio. I think it might have been a sheet that he was in when he passed away. Um, so my dad and the family prayed nightly, and um, he would put the little piece of cloth under his pillow uh, while he slept. And we ended up uh, taking him to um, a cancer institute in Houston, and they were going to do exploratory surgery to find out, you know, what was this brain tumor. And they had to do an MRI before the surgery. And the day of the surgery, um, we were waiting for him to be taken back, and a nurse came out and told us we could go home because the MRI had shown that the um, uh, tumor had gone away. And... Um, he lived another 13 years, and I just wanted to tell Wanda, thank you very much for sending that to us. Okay. I, the tumor has left, and, and he's all right? Yeah, he, he, he lived another 13 years. He passed away in 2017. Um, the doctors consider it inexplicable? They, we, we explored that, and I think some doctor had said that it was the type of tumor that there was like a 100,000 to one chance that a person could recover, and so I guess it was decided it wasn't an absolute complete miracle, but, but my dad always said that it, for him, it was a miracle, and I appreciate it. Marvelous. Please pray for another miracle. I will. I certainly will. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lovely. Mary. That is so beautiful. I'm so glad you, you shared that and you sent that in in the messages. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone to another young person here, Hannah. Um, you should be able to talk. Um, so if you want to ask your question, Hannah, if you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Um, that'd be great. Hey, hi. Um, I guess I have two questions. Uh, I think this is for Jason. Uh, my first question is like, how can young adults overcome being jaded 
after so many traumatic experiences and regain their hope and faith in love and in living in general. And then my second question is, how can young adult, adults who are striving to be saints feel less alone in their journey to live counterculturally? Because mo- most of my childhood friends are now either agnostics or lukewarm Catholics. So I really do feel alone when I'm with them. So should I look for new friends? But I also don't want to abandon my old friends. So uh, what should I do? No, Thank great you. questions, Hannah. Um, yes, you should look for new friends, but you don't need to necessarily abandon the old ones. And so I would say to only let go of the friends that are really pulling you down and pulling you away from God and leading a life of grace. If they're really pulling you away, then you need to create some distance there. But if you can be a positive impact in their life without yourself getting pulled from God, then you want, you want to keep them there you know, for their sakes. But yes, you need to make active effort to go find good people, whether it's getting involved in your diocesan youth and young adult programs, volunteering for a youth group so you can meet other good young adult leaders, going, you know, getting involved in the pro-life ministry or whatever types of ministries, there might be some other good, devout Catholic young adults because there's so many like you in the culture and you guys just haven't found each other yet. And so you've got to get at, because a lot of times we just kind of feel constrained in our social circles. And when it's like, wow, this isn't really how I want to live. This is not what I want to do on a Friday night. I'd like to be doing something else. And so without just wholeheartedly just abandoning all your old friends, start thinking, okay, where can I find more like-minded young adults? And a lot of people discover their vocations this way in the sense that they meet another good set, you know, set of guys or girls to hang out with, and they know some other good guys and other good girls. And just through those connections of solid godly friendships, you can sometimes discover the person God might have planned for you. But, you know, yeah, I would say, go look, go try to find and ask God for help. You know, God help me find the right group of friends because it's so important because you always become like your friends, right? I mean, St. Thomas, or no, who is St. Ignatius of Loyola, his college roommate was St. Francis Xavier. Well, now that kind of helps, doesn't it? And so to go find these good friends, it's super important. Another friend of mine said, uh, friends are like elevators. They either take you up or they take you down. And so you choose which kind of elevator you want to get into. The second thing in terms of trying to prevent feeling jaded from the traumatic experiences that you've gone through. One is don't underestimate the importance of getting some counseling, of finding a good Catholic therapist to kind of work through, because sometimes these wounds are are serious stuff. I mean, I was talking to someone just yesterday who's been through some serious stuff, and they're like, well, you know, I don't want to make such a big deal about it. And sometimes cultures are like that. Well, no, no, if you go to a counselor, it means you're in therapy and you're crazy, and so you don't want to do that. We don't do that in our culture. That's not healthy. You know, that's like saying, oh, well, we don't go to doctors when we break bones. You know, we just live with a crooked arm for the rest of our natural life because that's our culture. That's a broken culture and a broken bone. And so when it comes to the emotional wounds, you want to be able to talk those out, to find a good Catholic therapist. Uh, Here in the States, we've got catholictherapists.com, which is a nationwide directory of Catholic counselors, and many of them do Zoom. So you can do counseling, you know, that way. And, but if it's maybe not as major as something you think might need counseling, talk to friends, talk to families about the things that you've been through, and then just make sure that if you do have a wound, don't infect the wound, so to speak, meaning, yeah, I've got this thing that happened, but now I'm going to bury it under other mistakes to make the first mistake not look so big. And so we've got to make sure that we're not making the first injury worse by giving up. Because if you say, well, it's not a big deal, it's almost like you're saying you're not a big deal don't give up because what you'd be giving up on is is love. What you'd be giving up on is yourself and God. And so don't let go of that hope. Don't let go of that faith. Don't let go of the hope and love. Uh, The future, you know, as John Paul has said, depends on love. And so just love yourself enough to get the healing that you need and do as much as you can to find a good fellowship of, of good guy and girlfriends in your area. And I think if you put enough effort in that in prayer, God's really gonna bless that. And you're gonna realize you're not alone in wanting to pursue a life of faith and virtue. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for asking such a good question, Hannah. Um, that was awesome. So we have a number of good questions, but I know we need to wrap up here. Um, so if you have any last minute questions that you really want to ask, why don't you go ahead and type them in the Q&A to me. Um, and I'm going to let uh, John Riho here 
I'm going to make you unmuted um, and let you go ahead and ask your question. Um, sorry, here, a little technical. So let's see if you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, hi, Jason. Uh, this is for, uh, for you. What advice would you give dating couples who are striving to be saints? What are the ways they can cultivate chastity in their relationship? Thank you. So, yeah, so this is for an advice for dating couples trying to live chastity, Jason. Okay. And, you know, and he mentioned it's for all of us. So feel free, you know, Father Wanda, hop in as well. But I would say one of the most important things, just when it comes to the practical steps, is don't enter into a dating relationship with someone who doesn't share your values. Because, I mean, chastity is hard enough when you both agree with it. It's going to be a lot more difficult if you choose someone simply because of what they look like. And then a couple months into the relationship, realize, oh, wow, we really don't agree on some major spirituality and, and morality questions. And so make sure you have an adequate foundation of friendship first. And then you really get to know this person. Like, is this the type of person that I'd want to spend the rest of my natural life with? Is this person pursuing virtue? Does this person bring out the best in me? You know, do, do they want, do they encourage me to lead a godly life? And if the answer to those questions is no, then you have no business dating this person whatsoever. And so, yeah, I, I remember meeting one woman. She was, a, I think it was Miss Black California, this or that. She was on some TV show and they interviewed her and they said, wow, wow, you're still a virgin, you know, at the age of 24. That must be really hard. How hard was it to save that for marriage? And she's like, uh, it, it wasn't hard. I'm like, but you're an international beauty pageant star. It must have been difficult. It's like, no, I just don't date the wrong guys. You know, I only date a guy who's worthy of me, you know, and, and a man of God. And if he's not, then I'm not going to date him. So I don't need to make it that hard on myself. And it was such a fresh perspective of like, okay, it doesn't need to be super difficult. We just need to use a lot more prudence and wisdom and, and making it easier on ourselves. So I don't know, Wanda, if you had any other thoughts on how a person can embrace and practice the virtue of chastity um, and live that out in their life as a young adult? Well, I, I, I keep that. thinking that one must be involved, find other, be very much involved in, in life and what's happening, etc. I think Pier Giorgio, this was also, and then very important for Pier Giorgio was his, his uh, devotion to Virgin Mary and certainly Rosary having always a rosary in his pocket. And, uh, but I think most of all, really, really to find, find this world, there are so many fascinating, interesting things you can be involved with and follow it and follow Jesus. I think Pierre Giorgio for me is such an example, how faith, to the contrary of what one says, how faith gives freedom. And Pierre Giorgio said freedom is the greatest gift that God has given to men, it was freedom. And I think it's beautiful in Pierre Giorgio, one can see it, his choices, it's everything, that it's done by faith, which has given him freedom and joy, and enormous joy, always joy. I mean, you see Pierre Giorgio, even when he's suffering, he says, suffering, I thank God for this suffering because it helps me in, my, in, in building myself in my, in my faith. Well, there are so many things to say about the daughter that it's, it's No, that is, that's wonderful, Wanda. Um, yeah, I think that, that really sums it up in, there, we could go on forever, right? But, um, but we do need to end and we'll put this uh, to record so you, all of you who are watching can share with your friends and for those who couldn't be here. Um, but yet to sum up, living this full life, um, is what has come out as a theme in in this discussion today living a, f a full life and engaging in all that is beautiful and good and giving of yourself and it, jason's brought it up wanda's brought it up it doesn't need to be so so difficult um that doesn't mean that if it's difficult there's something wrong um the struggle is real like this it's it it can be difficult to live virtues. We can have deep wounds, some that need to be addressed in a deeper way. Um, we shouldn't be afraid of our weaknesses, but just to bring them to the Lord, um, bring them to people who can help engage in resources that can help us, but also just engaging in a, in a good full life of giving of ourselves can really be um, the foundation to living a, a saintly life that where your heart is free 
and you can live this joy that we see in the saints such as Pier Giorgio. Um, so, you know, what we'll do after this webinar is we will send you um, not only a link to this, but also some resources um, to further you and to support you in your path to sanctity. So, uh, you know, Jason has chastity.com. There's a lot of resources on there. You can get connected to his podcast, Lust is Boring, through that. Um, and there's that upcoming uh, Love Life conference as well um, that will really feed your soul in a lot of different ways. Um, there's also frasadiusa.org for those in the States um, as one of the uh, as a website that has a lot of information about Pier Giorgio and getting to know this saint, I totally recommend getting to know him as a friend and and a, a brother um, that can really help you on your journey. He has certainly been that for me. I could really go on, but I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just the host. I'm not a speaker, <laughs> so I'll spare you all. Um, and then Father David's book, of course, Pier Giorgio, Truth, Love, and Sacrifice. Um, and of course, the, but that's a new book. Um, I'm really excited to read that. I'm excited to be giving that away. And then also um, the books that Wanda's mother has written. She was Pier Giorgio's sister. So it was a brother and a sister. And she was his sister. And she um, was the one who really took it upon herself to spread Pier Giorgio's legacy. And then later on in life, Wanda had started helping. You started helping your mom, right? And then that, that became part of your life mission as well. Um, so there's the book, Man of the Beatitudes. Um, there's a book about his last days and there's his letters, um, that were referenced a few times, the book about the, the letters of Pier Giorgio, which are so beautiful and, and awesome. Um, so we'll send, we'll be sending out these different resources, um, so to help you guys on your journey. So thank you so much. Um, maybe Father David, if you could close us in just a little prayer and a blessing for all of those who are participating. We'd be so grateful. Okay. Yes. I actually, I have right here the prayer that is used um, in the Memorial Mass for Pier Giorgio Frassati. So I'm going to just read this, uh, this prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, God, our Father, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the splendor of creation, in the beauty of human life, touched by your hand, our world is holy. Inspired by the example of blessed Pier Giorgio Frassati, help us to cherish the gifts that surround us, to share your blessings with our brothers and sisters, and to experience the joy of life in your presence. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So let us make, never be afraid to make time for prayer and to make Jesus in the Eucharist center of our heart and of our lives. This will be the strength that we need um, to live in that, that freedom of purity of heart. So thank you so much to Jason, Wanda, and Father David for giving us this time. Thanks for everyone who joined us, and God bless you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>